All right. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Give it up for the sound man. Right. Sound men usually don't get a lot of love. I don't know. They're the hardest working people in the church next to the pastor, right? <laughs> but they don't get a lot of love and appreciation because they're always in the back, you know, working really hard, making sure that I look good and I sound good. And that's, that's a big feat. All right. All right. So now I just want to be able to transition, right? Uh, enough of the brain slides, right? I want to be able to transition into how um, substance abuse affects our family systems, right? And when I talk about family systems, because I'm systemically kind of oriented or trained, and I really believe that depending on our system or the, the environment that we live in, we can re either really um, um, have the ability to overcome certain things or not. Right? So it's really important to think about the family as the most important uh, factor that we should be paying attention to. Right? Again, like I said, you can have a family that is maybe struggling with, um, with poverty, right? but if they are connected, if they are supported, to one another, if they have a lot of empathy and love and compassion for one another, they can overcome a lot of obstacles in their lives, mm -hmm. right? And I've seen families that, you know, have a lot of resources and finances, but they are not doing well because they're not connected, because they don't have positive relationships with one another. So that's what I like to call, right? There is, uh, financial kind of wealth. Those are the people that have the finances and the resources. And then I like to, uh, uh, this other kind of term I call relational wealth. Mm -hmm. So if we have relational wealth, we're gonna be able to overcome a lot of adversities in life, right. right? So, talking about, um, again, how early life kind of stressors or you know, negative in, uh, experiences really affects our genes, our structure, right? We talked a little bit about in our, our section before how the brain is affected even in utero, right? So now I want to be able to talk about those intergenerational impacts of substance abuse on a family system, all right? So here we go. My pastor again said what? <laughs> I don't show a uh, text. It wasn't biblical. So Isaiah 41, 10. Let's read it together. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look around, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely will help you. Surely I will uphold you with what? My righteous right hand. There's hope, right? There is hope. And the, and the ability for us to understand that even in the midst of adversity and trials and tribulations and negative experiences and traumatic histories, we can rely on what? God. That God has us in his right hand. Mm -hmm. right? And if we can understand that, you know, one of the things that I, that I even talk to my interns and my students is, don't make the people that you work with in your counseling sessions dependent on you because you ain't going to live with them for the rest of your life. Amen to that. Right? Mm -hmm. Make them dependent on God. Yeah. Help them understand that that is where their healing comes from. That is where their source of strength comes from. Because if I can make them dependent on God and not me, I can sleep well at night understanding that God has everything in control and they understand where to go to and they're not calling my hotline in the middle of the night. <laughs> right? Or blowing up the pastor's phone. Pastor, I need to talk to you. Right? We need to connect people with the source of healing, which is God. And remember, we talked about the impacts of financial poverty and relational poverty. Right? So the best thing we can do with families is to ensure that they have positive relationships with one another and that they have positive um, uh, supports and, and uh, around them, right? I am a firm believer that if we have healthy families, 
we have a healthy church. Amen. Right? The pastor could be up here preaching, you know, the word every Sunday and, you know, and, and, and inspiring people. But healthy families is what makes a healthy church. So we have to be able to really um, consider that. Because in the world that we live in today, look at this. You know, many generations ago, we kind of lived in communities, right? And, you know, you know, and even as early as, you know, maybe even the 1800s, you know, we lived in these kind of, com you know, communities where a child had access to many um, uh, adults, hopefully healthy adults. But now, if you look at the way that we're kind of living, right, and it's not, you know, I don't like to put blame on anything because sometimes both parents have to work, right, in order to make financial ends meet. Um, but a lot of kids are coming home to an empty home. So if they don't have relational wealth at home and they're struggling with relational connections in school, is why we see a lot of kids struggling, not just academically, but even emotionally. So relational, relational wealth is very, very important. So in order to understand what makes a healthy family system, we have to think about that even at birth, right, depending, remember we talked about that neurobiology of, of brain development and that in utero experience. When that baby is born, depending on his interuterine uh, kind of developmental process, he already has a temperament that's present at birth, he or she, right? And the three types of temperaments that any child or any baby will have is what? One that is easy, slow to warm up, or difficult. Thank God that my, I only have one son, he, and thank God he has an easy temperament, right? That I can sit with him and say, Nick, you know, think about doing this versus that, and think about, you know, the consequences of this um, re, um, kind of um, decision that you may make and this type of decision you may make, right? That's easy for him and I to kind of have that relational experience but what about that child that has a difficult temperament? What's the first thing they're gonna, you know, when you think about this, you know, try to make this decision. Oh, I don't wanna hear that. Be quiet, right? And maybe other types of profane language. So we understand that temperament is important, but resiliency is the ability for us to cope and manage adversity. And that is built over time, depending on the relationships that we have with our children. And I say it all, remember, I did my doctoral kind of studies in neuroscience and attachment, trauma, and substance abuse. So I'm a believer that it all starts with attachment. That's right. And there are four kinds of attachment, right? So the most um, detrimental type of attachment is what we call disorganized attachment. A child that has many breaks in positive connections to their caregiver or maybe to people that can allow them to understand that they are loved, they're cared for, and that they're important. If they don't have those consistent, routine, repetitive interactions with their caregivers, they're gonna have disorganized attachment. And then the optimal kind is secure attachment that, you know, that when a child is in distress, they understand that no matter what they're going through, they have a, a caregiver that's gonna be there for them to take care of them, to love on them. So, understanding that there are four different types of attachment, that is going to compound, okay, so now you have a temperament that's already present at birth, and you have, uh, uh, you have to understand the importance of attachment, and then that's going to impact the ability for that child to be resilient when it comes to overcoming adversity, All right? So, how can a mom or a dad really focus on the formations of, you know, good, secure attachment? Right? It's all about the amount of time that that child spends with their caregiver. And you know what? I usually start my class, as, uh, my human development class. I'm going to give you this uh, inside, inside secret. When I start this class, the first day of school at CCSU, I tell, this, I tell my uh, counseling students, 
There is no such thing as spoiling a child. Those chairs are falling all over. What? What did he say? <laughs> right? What, what does our world tell us about, oh, if a child is crying, what, what, do you, what, you, what should you do? Don't pick them up. Let them cry. It builds character. <laughs> or you're going to spoil them. It's completely the opposite. When a child is crying, yeah, we check their diapers, we make sure they're fed, and all, but the, if they continue to cry, it's because their neural networks are dysregulated and all they need to do is what? Be held. And what does that message send to that, that, that infant or that, or that baby? That they're loved, that they are cared for, that they're in a safe environment, and that creates what? Secure attachment. So the worst thing you can do is, oh, you know, don't pick up that baby. Don't tend to them. You know, let them cry in the crib. Just shut the door. You are playing a dangerous game of Russian roulette with a disorganized attachment formation process for that child. So there's no such thing as spoiling a child. Well, think about the messages that that child received. I cry, nobody comes to my aid. I cry, nobody gives me physical affection, right? So babies can't, they can communicate, but they can't communicate verbally, right? They can't say, oh, I'm really, I'm really hungry, that's why I'm crying, right? So they cry, that's their form of communication. You have to be able to meet that need. And when you don't, you're playing, again, like I said, a dangerous game with disorganized attachment processing. We have five senses, so the most important must be touch. Touch, right? What happens? You know what happens when, a ch when, a, when an infant or a baby is picked up and you wrap them in your arms and you just do this? What? Yes, they get endorphins, oxytocin, all of that stuff. But what is neurobiologically going on for that child? Bonding, yes. What else? Think, think about that in utero process. What's going on? They feel, but they're remembering. Ah, oh, this this is familiar. The rocking, the heartbeat that you know that they're hearing because they're being held tightly. It reminds them of a safe place when they were in utero, and that begins to this. It allows for that dysregulation to become soothe just by the rocking motion it's the same kind of similar process that was going on when they were in utero or in the womb where they were being rocked and they were hearing foo -foo, foo -foo, foo -foo, foo -foo, right that kind of heartbeat and they're now they're like oh this is really familiar and they get and they they're able to soothe themselves yes yes i totally agree yes yeah, oh, yeah, no, we'll come here. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was just going to say that um, when we talk about disorganized attachment, in, in, uh, in one of uh, my clients, a seven-year-old boy, he has, you know, reactive attachment disorder. And one of the things that he was able to say when I was working with him is that, you know, I don't trust that the adults can take care of me. Mm -hmm. I yeah. have to take care of myself. I have to do it all myself. There are breaks in, in those connections, so... And his mental world is, I'm on my own. I can't depend on anyone. Right? And how scary is that? Right? How scary is that? So, this is the selfish plug, right? So I wrote this book called The Father-Child Attachment that's in the back. <laughs> right? But I wrote the book... You know, a lot of times uh, people will say, why did you write the book? Because, you know, it's important for fathers to know the relation, you know, the impacts of their. Yes. But I really wrote the books for moms to really understand the benefits of their child having a positive relationship with their father, even if their relationship is dissolved and they are no longer in that relationship with their father, but not to use that child as a what? As a pawn to get back at the father 
because it's more important for that child to have a, a, a secure attachment with their father, just like their mom. And there's even greater benefits. Right? I'm not saying one relationship is better than the other. But when we start to look at and I'm going to highlight a couple points, but it's all um, um, detailed in the book. Um, secure father child attachment. Kids that have a secure father child attachment have better social performance in school. Right? And what are we struggling with right now? Kids bullying each other, all these school shootings. You know, one of the work that I do is I'm part of the Anna Grace Project, right? Um, Nelva Marquez Green and I um, have been childhood friends since middle school. We went to Cork Middle School together and Hartford Public High School together. And she lost her daughter, Anna Grace, in Sandy Hook, right? And what we, when, when they did the Blue Ribbon Commission study and they wanted to see what happened there, and we start to look at the fact that this uh, maladjusted, disconnected young man, Adam Lanza, did not have positive connections to his father or even his mother, right? And now, because of that, he is socially disconnected. So when a person is socially disconnected, they don't have empathy. They can't, they, they don't know what compassion is because they're socially disconnected. That level of, uh, of compassion and empathy is not there, right? So children in kindergarten have higher grades in, in high school, father involvement associated with cognitive gains. And look at this. They have a higher IQ score of even eight points or more. Just by having a positive relationship with their father. So, moms, if you're no longer in a relationship with your children's father, it's still important for them to have a relationship with them. Unless, like in my case, your, my father was unhealthy. So my mom had to protect me from my father who was abusive, who used to, you know, I kind of grew up in domestic violence shelters from the age, from the time I was born to maybe up to the age of seven, just running from my dad because he was dangerous. Heavy substance abuser, right? Addicted to alcohol, angel dust, PCP, right? Just a violent guy. And when he passed away, he was a different guy. But I understood it was the substance abuse and his lack of mental health treatment. That, that's the reason why he functioned that way. He wasn't really a bad guy. He just did bad things because he didn't have the right supports and the right treatment. Right? So what helps kind of build family systems? I like to say that self-esteem is based on these three sources. If, as a parent, you can do this, you have done your job as a mom and dad, or as a grandma and grandpa, because we're seeing a lot more grandparents taking care of their grandchildren nowadays. Right? I worked at DCF, the Connecticut Department of Children and Families, for 15 years, and we saw how a lot of children, instead of going into foster care, which is a good thing, we're going into kinship or relative care, but most of them were going into grandparent um, kind of care. So what are the messages of love and approval that they are receiving from their caregiver, from their parent? What are the specific attributes and competencies that we as parents can identify in our children and say, you're good at this and you're good at that. You have this skill, you have this potential. What, because we always constantly compare ourselves with one another. I'm pretty sure when you walked into church today, you compared yourself to somebody like, hmm, oh. right, I, I look better than this person. Oh, man, I should have maybe ironed my pants a little bit more. Right? We're always comparing ourselves. Kids do that all the time. So to be able to talk to your children and say, you are, you have these qualities and you have these abilities and God has said this over your life. How many of you say God has said this over your life to your children? 
Right? Since my son was born, I've been speaking into him. God says this, that, that you are going to be able to accomplish this, that you are going to achieve this, that you have this potential. We believe in you because God said it and we are your parents and we're going to co continue to support you so that you can achieve your destiny. Healthy family systems, you need to do this. Okay? Because this is what we call... Uh, this serve and return process, it needs to occur. You need to be able to, you know, when your child and you are communicating, you have to be able to say you are loved. You are protected. You are cared for. These, these are the um, attributes and the competencies that you have, right? So there's this process of, you know, going back and forth that we call serve and return that is really important and vital for, for uh, children to have with their parents. Okay? So making sure that there's good eye contact, that there's warmth, that there's uh, love and empathy is vital for, for this process of serve and return. So we have to also understand that when children are struggling with this kind of server return or with dysregulated neural networks or they're struggling to maintain positive peer relationships or even relationships within the family system, we have to really need to have this approach of, okay, let's stop, let's calm down, let's think before we act. Let's try to solve this problem together of how you're feeling and what, what is, what is really, what is really um, bothering you or what is, allowing you, what is not allowing you to feel the sense of love and connection that you, you should understand you have, right? Can I have a question? Yes. What if you have a child that will not talk to you? Uh, they're open up to you and they don't want to confide in you like that. You have to go back to the basics, right? To be able to establish relationships because if you don't have a relationship, you don't have authority, mm -hmm. right? So some people say, I'm the man of the house, I wear the pants here, and you gotta listen to me. But if there was no relationship prior to that, they ain't gonna listen to you, right? So they have to understand that I, okay, because I've built this relationship with this, with this, with my mom or with my dad or my grandma, or my grandpa, because I built this relationship, now when they speak to me, I am receptive to what they're sharing. But that comes with time, right? And it comes with a lot of patience. <laughs> so drug, um, when, when um, drugs kind of, have this ability to, because it interrupts the process of building relationships, because we're not in a right state of mind, because we're struggling with this, you know, altered kind of mental health status or condition, right? We start to see all these different types of dysfunctions because of drugs, right? So we start to see psych psychosis, we start to see depression, we start to see anxiety, panic attacks. But what I'm really concerned is, again, the brain fully matures around what age? 25. 25. Also, there is when we start to see some of what we call psychotic breaks around middle, you know, early adulthood around 25. So anything they did prior to that that they did to their brains by using drugs or alcohol or the lack of secure attachments. Now we start to see mental health conditions or, uh, or issues around this age of 25. So what, what happens? Why, so what happens to them and why is you know, mental illness and substance abuse, what we call this co-occurring disorder, what is that, what's going on for that individual? Why are they smoking marijuana? They haven't learned the proper way to cope with stress and anxiety or the lack of relationships. So they what? They self-medicate. Escape. Escape. I can't deal with this. I'm going to check out. Right? But that's only temporary. Right? So, but we know there's casual effects, right? Because substance abuse, because it's co-occurring, now it's going to allow for vulnerabilities, and the vulnerabilities that I'm talking about is mental health conditions. Right? So there are correlated causes between substance abuse and mental health issues. 
So here you see this kind of early onset substance abuse in, 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 in adolescence and young adulthood. Now we start to see, you know, some of the, you know, paybacks of all of that now in adulthood. We start to see anxiety, mood disorders, depression, social phobias, right? But what are some of the protective factors? This is what we need to focus on. We need to be able to understand that, yeah, self-control is good. You know, you need to learn self-control. But again, self-control is what we call a top-down processing of the brain. And we don't function that way. We function, what, bottom up. So how many of you have ever said, you need to calm down and the person really calmed down? <laughs> right? That, again, that's a top-down kind of perspective. Calm down. You can't because their brain stem is dysregulated, their heart rate is up, their work, they're worked up, they're, now they're in their midbrain, they're dysregulated, so now they're, they're feeling unsafe. Now we start to see this fight or flight response um, to, to um, mood dysregulation, and then now because if they don't have healthy relationships, their limbic system is off because that's where we continue to um, have the ability to relate. So. We're, we operate the opposite. We operate bottom up, but we always tell people, you need to calm down. You need to, le you need to learn some self-control. And it's, it doesn't work that way. But learning self-control is something that we should work at. Right? So academic competence, if they're doing well in school, giving anti-drug information or prevention is also important. Strong uh, attachments. You know, and then there are genetics, where we're going to talk about next. So, uh, oh, I, I kind of threw this in here because it's important. If you have a family member that is struggling with any kind of opiate use or abuse, you should have one of these Narcan kits in your home, right? Police officers, EMT, first responders, firefighters, they all carry it now. And with the... the <laughs> The epidemic in fentanyl being out there now, it is just a lifesaver for you to have this. And you can get a naloxone or a Narcan kit for free just by going to your uh, pharmacy, right? Free of charge. I'm sorry, what is that? So Narcan or naloxone, remember how the brain has these receptor sites, remember? that cocaine can block those sites or marijuana or any kind of drugs. So Narcan does the same thing. It blocks these receptor sites so when a person uses an opiate, they don't get high. Or when a person is in the process of overdosing, the Narcan blocks the receptor sites so that they don't overdose. Right? Pretty cool stuff. Uh, uh, pharmacies now are able to write their, the prescription right there and give it to you. You don't have to go to like your primary care doctor. You know, Connecticut has a new law now where you can go to any pharmacy and get a Narcan kit if you have a family member um, or a friend, right? They, they don't ask you questions like, well, who in your family is abusing opiates? They don't do that. They just, you just say, I need a Narcan kit for my home. Right there? And get it for free, okay? Please, please, please. It's a lifesaver. The Department of Public Health is coming out with an app, too. App. And the app is going to allow folks to at least kind of be like that first responder, whether it's, you know, the police officer, the EMT, you know, when someone's talking about it, you know, giving them resources, and they're able to get that kind of help. Yeah. Um, I know that there's a lot of people that are going to be using that app for the first time, and it's going to be a great way to kind of help them out. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Michelle. Our family advocate. Give it up for Michelle. Yeah. Michelle does a lot of work. And she is not paid for most of that work that she does, right? So we thank you, Michelle, for what you do on behalf of all families in Connecticut. All right? Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about stress because, you know, family stress is something that we all have, right? I, you know, when people call me and say, hey, Dr. Cassiano, you know, I want to come set up an appointment with you because I want to live a stress-free life. I said, I'm sorry, I'm not your guy, and I hang up on them. It, there's no such thing as living a stress-free life. How you manage stress is, is, is what we should really, really understand, and, and we're going to talk about that next. So there are three levels of stress, right? So there's positive, tolerable, and toxic stress. So po you know, positive stress is 
I left my conference in Hartford at five o'clock and I was like, oh my God, I know there's gonna be traffic on 84 because Waterbury, there's always traffic in Waterbury. <laughs> so I gotta leave on time. I gotta make sure that I don't stay behind and talk too much with the folks in my EMDR training because I gotta get to Waterbury. That's positive stress, right? Tolerable stress is something that, okay, you know, maybe there is financial difficulties or maybe you're going through something right now personally and maybe there's a medical condition and you're really stressed about it. And it's, it's tolerable because you know hopefully it is temporary and hopefully there is a solution at the end of it, right? Toxic stress is ongoing. I never know when it's gonna happen. I, I can't control it. Um, and I, don't, I can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Toxic stress, right? Three levels of stress. So prolonged stress changes the way our brain also um, kind of um, um, is uh, kind of processes the way we see life. So the way I like to uh, kind of just kind of show you this real quickly is the neurobiology of trauma and stress, right? We have this, what we call HPA axis. Say HPA axis. HPA axis. So stress activate this HPA, this HPA axis, and it says we are um, being attacked by stress. We need to do something about it in order to um, be able to overcome this. So we are going to release this hormone called what? Cortisol. Cortisol is good if I am in the woods and I see a bear and I'm stressed and cortisol says, okay, we're going to shut down some of these physiological functions so that we can send all the blood that you need to your what? Yeah. To your legs so I can do what? Run. Run. That's good. Cortisol helps with that. But... If cortisol is constantly being pumped because of toxic stress, now that cortisol is toxic to our physiological functioning, and we're going to start to see some medical conditions due to um, um, too much cortisol. Uh, uh, Hypotyroidy uh, um, um, adrenal um, access. Here we go. Hypothalamic pituitary access. Adrenal gland, all right? So, so this is what's happening, right? So toxic stress sends a message to our HPA um, axis, release cortisol so that we can, what? Use other body symptoms so that we can escape whatever danger or, or stressful situation. But what happens over time, if cortisol continues to be pumped out, we're gonna see um, um, our immune system, um, kind of be uh, attacked and now we're going to start to see some inflammatory issues and you're going to be like man why did I get this illness in regards to you know an inflamed system or my uh, CNS or central nervous system is, is, is sick or you know kind of attacked right and we also start to see you know um, these infections um, in our different ty uh, organs because of too much cortisol in our body. Um, I know it's one of the thyroid disease, right? Thyroid disease, could it, could it cause um, disease? Well, there's different uh, ways that uh, cortisol um, attacks and inflames our, our body, right? So it, MS, but I'm not saying that stress causes MS, right? I'm not, I'm not taking that leap, uh -huh. but there are you know, contributing factors to inflammatory diseases because of toxic stress in our system. Mm -hmm. um, is cortisol always oh, yeah. Stress or just a of how much? Yeah, so cortisol is how we kind of deal with stress, right? So I know I, I'm not a student, but if I'm a student, I know I have an exam on Friday, so I'm gonna have what? Positive stress. So I'm gonna have a little cortisol to get me to study, to make sure I get my notes in place. But at the end of the day, I take my exam and it's over, now cortisol is no longer being released. But if you live in an environment where your parent is physically abusing you, or a family member is sexually abusing you, and you're constantly under attack with 
toxic stress and cortisol is being pumped out over over time now you know we're gonna have struggles with what I call the epigenetics sorry so our gene expression is gonna be altered and this is where epigenetics is the next important kind of scientific study or breakthrough that we're starting to recognize not just in, in, in trauma and stress but even substance abuse right so what happens epigenetics is we have this genetic material right that is kind of we already own and is passed down by generations so because of epigenetics it means that if we have in our history um, family members that have extreme trauma or extreme stress guess what that begins to um, be embedded in our genetic material or our genetic makeup and over time that continues to be passed down all right so epigenetics of substance abuse says that the manner in which trauma is passed down from one generation to the next the same thing occurs with substance abuse so this really groundbreaking study that really uh, uh, allowed for us to pay mind to epigenetics and what we call intergenerational trauma, right? So if you have family members, there was a study that studied family members of the Holocaust. Toxic stress, right? Life-threatening kind of environment or you know lifestyle imagine the stress the cortisol that was kind of embedded in that generation this study found that the generation of the Holocaust three generations later their family members had those um, genetic um, um, epigenetics predisposition of what we call deterioration in their telomeres and you're gonna go what's that that's a telomere, right? So telomere is, if you look at your shoelace, right? If you have shoelaces, <laughs> you know the plastic um, at the end of the shoelace? What does that do for your shoelace? Keeps it together and it protects it, right? So we have, our chromosomes have these telomeres at the end that protects our chromosome, that protects our genetic makeup. What we saw in the study of the generation of the Holocaust was that three generations later, their family members had shortened telomeres because of the epigenetics of their stress. Same thing applies to substance abuse. So if you have a family member that abuses drugs or alcohol, it attacks the telomeres in their chromosome and generations later, you can see the effects or the predisposition of them being at a higher risk to abuse drugs and alcohol. And you're like, yeah, we, we, we kind of get that because if they say, right, my father, you know, my father was an alcoholic. So I, you know, not, not only because I'm born again and I love Jesus, I don't drink, but I understand that I'm at a higher risk because of my epigenetics to be an alcoholic and a substance abuser because of my father. And I taught that to my son. Because what? We know three generations later, he's still at risk. So even though I stopped, guess what? It's going to be generations later before we can hopefully fix the epigenetic uh, damage that my father passed down to me. So I told my son, Nick, stay away from alcohol and drugs because of this. I explained it to him, and he understands the power of epigenetics. Yes. So you, yes. So it definitely shortens lifespan. And I, I don't want to say, you know, because telomeres kind of shorten anyways during a normal lifespan. But if if you if you already have been given a shortened telomere, your lifespan is just that shorter. Right. Epigenetics. Just want you to understand it. So quick question. Yes.
is it that simple? Like, why why don't they check to see what their cortisol is? There a way to check your cortisol level, or why don't they start somewhere there to say, okay, what's going on here in the brain? Well, the the it's it's expensive, but it's scientifically we can we can check cortisol levels by blood tests. We can check even um, telomere strength or health by blood tests. All right, so we can start to see the impact, but we're going to need generations of that right, to really kind of say, okay, this is our baseline, but we need previous kind of samples as well to really understand the impact and the power of it. Right. So impacts of toxic stress on our immune system, we already know it begins to attack our immune system. We get sicker and sicker and sicker if we don't manage stress and anxiety and trauma. And I know there's gonna be a lot of great facilitators that are gonna talk about trauma, so I won't spend too much time. But look, I want you to understand because I remember I teach this course on psychiatric uh, disorders at CCSU, and, I, and I, one of the things because of science and the way that we're seeing research, I want them to understand that there are two different responses to threats or trauma and stress, right? So. When a person has a significant history of trauma, they can what? Dissociate or they can become hyper or hypo aroused, right? So that doesn't mean that because of a person, their, their, their traumatic kind of disposition or response to trauma is that they dissociate, that they're psychotic. Oh, they're dissociating because it's their brain's way of protecting them to say, this is too painful. We need to check out. That doesn't mean that they're psychotic or that they have an issue with dissociative identity disorder. So we have to be careful because a lot of times trauma can look like DID or dissociative identity disorder. And even trauma, a lot of kids that you see in schools now, they can't pay attention. They can't sit still, right? And they're like, oh, ADHD. No sometimes it can be trauma because when a child is struggling with trauma look they're they're hyper vigilant they're anxious they're reactive they're in this fight or fight or freeze kind of response so that looks like ADHD but it's really a, a response or a way of trauma of how they're managing the, or not managing their trauma okay so I won't talk too much about trauma because you're gonna get a lot of that but we have to understand that if there's a traumatic event, and if it's prolonged and we don't do anything about it, it's going to alter our neural system, right, our neural networks. So what do we do? Kind of um, way of how in the neurosequential model of therapeutics we look at it is, okay, so there is stress, there is trauma. Remember, we talked about that there's hyperarousal and there's dissociation that can occur on how we manage that if we're not able to have good coping skills or connections or relationships that allow us to heal. So how do we get there? If we understand, if we are able to understand that if a person is dealing with stress or trauma and it's unpredictable and it's severe, right, it's it's happening over and over again, it's toxic, they're going to have this kind of prolonged approach or experience of trauma, and it's going to make them feel what? Vulnerable. But if we're able to work with that family member, and we're able to say, yes, you are experiencing trauma, or yes, you have experienced trauma, and you are experiencing a high level of stress, and we can help you so that it can be moderate, because now you have connections, you have relationships, you have support to be able to moderately um, understand that, yes, okay, I'm under attack by trauma and stress, but because it's predictable, and I have supports, and it's moderate, and I can control it, guess what's that called? Resilience. So we want to help our family members go from a process of feeling vulnerable to feeling resilient. And I know that's easier said than done. It's a process that uh, requires a lot of support and connection. So trust and unconditional love form the foundations for what? A relationship and building resilience has to be from trust and unconditional love that 
we hope is in that family system to be able to allow that family member to overcome drugs, alcohol, or even a mental health condition. If we're able to do this, if we're able to help a person regulate, remember, regulation comes from what? This bottom up, right? You don't say, calm down, you need to calm down. That's a top down approach. It doesn't work. But if we help our family members learn how to regulate, right? Then in that process of them being more regulated, now they're able to what? Build healthier relationships. And in that process of building relationships, now they're able to do what? Reason. Make better choices and have a better opportunity to reason. But you can't make good choices if you're dysregulated. So the key is regulation. Self-regulation is key. So how can we be regulated is you have these two forms of reg uh, uh, self-regulation. You have to have this kind of in internal process, right? This somatic input. And then you have to have this external or outward process from your family members and relationships that you build that are healthy, that are able to allow you to uh, better regulate. And no, there, this is a very stressful time in my life, but I know I have the capacity because I have supports and relationships around me. So there's this, you know, uh, ACE study, and I won't spend too much time on it because I know I have a few minutes left. But ACEs is adverse childhood experiences. Hopefully, one of my colleagues is going to cover it. Um, but we found, uh, well, not we. You know, I'm, I'm talking. I'm, I'm Dr. Vincent Falletti or something. He's the originator of the study, and Dr. Robert Anda. They looked at if. Uh, the number of adverse childhood experiences, for, you know, they had these 10 questions. And the higher A score you got, one point for each question, one through 10, the higher A score you had, the more vulnerable or the more predisposed you were to um, having substance abuse issues, disrupted neurodevelopmental kind of process, you know, lack of relationships, and even early death. You, um, you can go to um, aces2high.org, and on there you'll see the ACE score or the ACE assessment. And just to tell you, because I, you know, I, I want to be able to say, okay, look, so it looks at psychological abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, violence against your mother or violence in the home, um, if any substance abusers were living in your home, um, if anyone in your home had um, struggled with any kind of mental health condition, if any member of your home struggled with you know, incarceration, right? So these 10 questions are there, and you start to say, yep, happened to me, happened to me, happened to me. So there are risk factors for diseases, right? We're talking about cancer, high blood pressure. All of this has been found for individuals that had four ACEs or higher. So, because we know that the impacts of childhood and adolescence is, those impacts are what? Carried into adulthood. So I know, because I have an ACE score of seven, that if I don't work really hard to have a healthy self-regulated system or have healthy connections to other individuals, I know that if I don't do that, I'm at high risk for substance abuse. I'm at high risk for medical conditions that can lead to early death because of my A score of seven. Right? So I, I recorded this TED talk, you can look it up on YouTube, and in there I go into a little bit about my personal story and how ACEs really affected me and how it was the power of relationships that saved me, right? From my high school principal to uh, my uh, uh, counselor in college and even my own bishop. If it wasn't for those three individuals, allowed me to overcome my A score of seven. And because again, I grew up without a father, right? So all of that um, impact. So 
Emotional competence. I want you to walk away with this level of emotional competence. Is being aware of your own personal goals, values, and belief. You have to know that. Understanding the cultural and ethnic differences that we have amongst one another and even in the world. Right? That allows us to be emotionally competent. And demonstrating that we have good self-regulation skills. If you don't, it's okay. But it's not okay to not learn and grow and be able to develop a healthy uh, self-regulation uh, capacity. And knowing your personal triggers, right? That's something that we kind of talk a lot about in counseling. But because a lot of people are in denial, right, of what really triggered their substance use. What really triggered their anger issues or aggression? So we have to really come to a courageous finding or courageous assessment of what really happened to me and how I can overcome that by recognizing it and connecting with healthy individuals and just learning good positive self-regulation skills. So there's this, there's this uh, what can you do to be fully present for your family member? There's this model that I'm going to cover really quickly with you. It's through um, Internal Family Systems, IFS, by Dr. Richard Schwartz. Um, and he wrote this um, phenomenal book called Meta Frameworks, or the Internal Family System. And here he talks about the, the qualities of self-leadership. Right? You want to have a healthy family system? You have to be a healthy individual. And how you are a healthy individual is having these eight C's that he calls in self-leadership. One is you have to be able to um, master the competency of being calm, being able to maintain physical calmness in the midst of stressful situation. Right? I have this really big problem with anger management uh, kind of therapy, the way it's kind of, kind of done. And I'm going to share with you why. Because in anger management, they say, when you're upset and you're angry, you should do what? Calm down. <laughs> Calm down. No, but what, what are some of the techniques they tell you in anger management? Huh? Punch a pillow. Punch a pillow. What else? Scream into a bag or something, right? What else? Stop or until you self-check. Right? So in anger management... Good anger management is not punching something else. Because guess what? If, if I'm arguing with my wife, instead of hitting her, I'm punching something else. Is she feeling safe? No. Because I'm not aggressively attacking her, but I'm still aggressive. Right? So that's not good anger management. So anger management is understanding that anger is a normal emotion, right? It's what we do with our anger. So instead of, you know, you don't replace, and this is true for substance abuse uh, treatment as well, you don't replace one addiction with another. So why in anger management will you place aggression with another form of aggression, right? It doesn't make sense. So you have to be able to learn how to be calm, learn that you know you should be curious right about why your family member is behaving a certain way rather than you know you never do this right or you're this or you're that you never you don't you always doesn't work be curious i want to understand why you're struggling around i want to know why you're mad right be curious about it instead of blaming have compassion right seeing behind your family members you know, what we call angry parts or, you know, dysregulation, seeing beyond that and having compassion to know that they're struggling right now and they need you. Right? Having confidence, right? You have to have a high level of confidence and understanding that you can, you know, trusting that even if your family member is upset with you, you still see yourself as good and you're trying your best. And you're, you're trying your best. So stay confident. Don't give up. Have courage. Speak for your own what we call extreme polarized parts, right? You're like, what is that? So for instance, if my wife and I are arguing and, you know, and I'm upset, I can say, you know what? I'm upset and I'm feeling this way because of this way or that or this, right? I am, you know, again, uh, you know, 
trying to speak from my own extreme parts and I'm not blaming and that doesn't help, right? But maintain clarity, you know, from an undistorted view and, and you know, try to kind of, you know, take a step back and try to understand the situation, right? Connectedness, right? So staying connected, no matter what, understanding that your family member or your loved one is going through something, but you're gonna stay connected and you're gonna support them as much as they can so that they can overcome their substance abuse, their mental health distress, or whatever it may be. And be creative, right? Being free to, you know, be creative. If you know that you tried something and didn't work, will you do it again? Right? What's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting a different result. So if you try something with your teenage son and it didn't work, why would you keep doing it? Right? Be creative. Come up with a different solution. Right? So when to refer to mental health services when there is mental illness, when there is an inability to care for themselves, if, if your loved one is struggling with suicidal or homicidal thoughts, or even if they have a plan, that's probably 911, you have to call right away. Uh, if they're struggling with substance abuse, domestic violence, child, child abuse, um, um, any kind of elder abuse, and even animal abuse, all of these are signs that you should connect your family member with mental health services. All right. So the recipe for human uh, well-being, and I'm closing, um, is a good beginning. Remember, we talked when we first started way back at 715. <laughs> we started talking about the what is a good beginning, right? A healthy mother that allows for a healthy kind of in uterine process for that child. And then when that child is born, they have what? Secure attachment, that their needs are met, and on and on and on. They're connected. They have positive relationships with caring adults. And you being here means that you're becoming what? More trauma-informed, right? And more informed about how substance abuse really affects families. But enduring mindfulness practice is all about, again, understanding that self-regulation is key. So mindfulness and meditation is all about ensuring that our brainstem is, has a healthy dose of self-regulation so that then we can use our long loop so that we can make good choices, right? So let's read this and, we're, and we'll, we'll, we'll finish. John 14, 27 says what? Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. God did not give us a spirit of fear. Right? God did not give us a spirit of fear. We may go through very difficult things in life, but we know, right, that God has us what? In his right hand. And he told us not to be fearful, right? So, Let's stand. My, my bishop says in order to end, you have to have everyone stand. And then that's a sign that we're closing. <laughs> and let's repeat this prayer. Oh, all right. Ready? Father, this evening, my fellow pastors, leaders, brothers and sisters may feel tired worn out and stressed as they do their best to help people deal with substance use and mental health concerns. Give them rest in your presence and calm their anxiety and stress. You tell us, Lord, not to worry, and we thank you that we can rest in your promises even when life is stressful. Give my brothers and sisters wisdom in setting healthy boundaries and not overcommitting themselves. Guide us all in making wise decisions. You are in control of everything, Jesus. Teach us to trust you rather than trying to control on our own. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. <laughs>